Well, Brent, she's doing okay. She's just been grooming it and licking at the wound very tentatively. Obviously, it's quite sore, especially with that rough tongue of hers. So she's just been doing a little bit of maintenance. You can see she's grooming around that area. I'm sure there's a bit of blood that also gets onto her coat from that wound. And so it's still seeping a little bit. So she's just, you see, she's very gentle around that area. And I'm sure it's quite painful, but she's just keeping it clean. And she, this is how she has to do it in order to be able to get it right. And you can see, look, there she's grooming it shame my girl is that a bit tender I would imagine it's very tender see, she's gentle though look she's amazing how much more gentle she is than she would be if it was the normal coat Helen you're asking if lions have healing properties in their saliva no not so much and in fact actually their saliva for us as people is very bad for us it's got lots of bacteria that can cause all kinds of things but what it is is that she's doing is she's grooming and she's getting rid of any sort of parasites that might be getting in there she's also cleaning getting rid of any dirt so her rough tongue is getting out the um, dust and dirt and all the other stuff that could cause a little infection to start so even though they've got a lot of bacteria in their mouths that for us as humans they've able to deal with that bacteria but they're able to clean it and keep the the dirt and horrible stuff out of it as well as controlling the parasite numbers inside there so that's why she's getting in there and she's just getting rid of all of that and, and just making sure that the wound itself is kept basically washed if you want to call it that but there's no antibacterial properties that are in her in her um, saliva remember that these guys eat rotting meat and all kinds of other things and that means that they do get a little bit of a nasty mouth with a bit of bacteria and in fact whenever you're dealing with lions you've got to really be very careful and wash your, your hands and, and make sure you disinfect quite a bit because there's all kinds of nasty things that live on lions in the wild and well their immune systems are just able to deal with it so the grooming is just all like I said to keep the wound clean of dust and dirt and to make sure an infection doesn't start via that route but Simfumo is probably my favorite part of this whole sighting right now he's lying like the boss that's how you lie when you are the boss of what's going on <laughs> look at him he's got paw on the belly or on the chest legs are wide open and he's just really taking it very easy so he's a happy happy cat at the moment but what is amazing is just to look at the size of his muzzle and his face in comparison to the lionesses so the lionesses have these kind of they i mean they're not small animals by any stretch of the imagination but these boys dwarf them in terms of the size of their head and face and the size of their legs they've got these massive paws i mean look at the size of that paw imagine being hit by that that's almost like the size of a dinner plate that you're dealing with so not a something you would want to be on the receiving end of but very funny when he's sitting like this and look at his back legs he's kicking he's busy running <laughs> he was moving his back legs there we go <laughs> are you dreaming Mfumo. so he's obviously having a good dream about chasing something or other because the back legs were moving around and he was kind of kicking them he stopped now but that was quite funny like I said, that is the sort of quintessential king of the area lion mode that you see right there. It's as good as it gets in terms of a male lion. You, <laughs> if you want to see them moving. Now, I wonder if our injured female is going to move. It looks like she might get up soon. She's kind of looking around. So I'm hoping that she will get up because I really want to see how she's walking. Uh, I would imagine she must have somewhat of a limp. The guys say they they didn't see her limping, but there must be some sort of limp on that leg. It can't be pleasant when she's walking. And so I want to try and just see how much discomfort she's in. But watching her groom there was actually quite interesting because she was basically grooming and you could see there's a fissure between that muscle and it's actually not as bad as I thought it would be. It's, it's not right down towards the bone. She's able to kind of lick the meat and just kind of clean it all out and you can see the flies landing back on there again now but it's not as bad as I, I thought it would be and she certainly if she's putting her muzzles deep into that wound and grooming it's not as painful as I thought it would be either so she's obviously doing okay and just shows you how strong and how tough 
lions can be to deal with something like that and still be able to groom it if you had to do that to a person and say to them right i'm going to clean this out with a rough s sponge they would be in serious pain and probably shrieking and going crazy if this lioness just does it on her own and is still moving around and walking with the pride it's quite incredible actually Jared's buddy you're asking about plants that have an antiseptic or numbing effect um, there are one or two um, not that the lions would ever use it um, just so in relation to what we're seeing now there are some now in the in the summer I mean the winter months difficult to show you a lot of them and most of the ones that I know of are pretty herbaceous in in their treatment of things um, but I know that the guys will use a variety of different plants so in terms of pain relief the tamburti plant um, for especially toothache they say if there's an infection that the, the latex from tamburti will help clean up the infection and also deaden the pain so that's a sort of pain reliever um, the devil's thorn has got an antiseptic property in it so when you mix that with water it goes quite soapy and that's got a bit of an antiseptic to it so that's another one that we have but now in the in the winter you don't see devil thorn much at all it's a more summer growing little kind of low creeper to the ground um, just trying to think what else is out here there's so many and I'm just drawing a blank all of a sudden uh, when it comes to summer we get I'm just trying to think of the other herbaceous plants that they use as antiseptics it's always one of those things when you want to think of something and you just forget completely I'll get to it so eventually it will come to mind and I'll remember some of the other plants but like I say devil thorn is one and and the tamburti for deadening of pain um, is another so as they come to me I will remember and I will try and get a more comprehensive list in the next little bit as I'm sitting here thinking about it I will tell you one thing though it is the weather is becoming more foul by the minute it's really not very pleasant out here in fact my eyes are burning from the amount of dust that is being blown into them and clouds are coming in from the eastern horizon at the moment they're slowly but surely moving this way and and it's getting cloudier and cloudier now I did say that we were supposed to get a bit of rain this afternoon but I'm not sure if we will it's the clouds don't quite look like rain clouds they're more kind of wispy clouds at the moment but they it's amazing to see how they've come because when we started this morning the sunrise came up and we didn't have any sign of clouds anywhere here there was no clouds it was a completely clear sky now the whole eastern and northern horizon is pretty much a clouded bank and it's just coming over as we're going and it's interesting because now it's the weather system that's coming off the Mozambican channel as opposed to a weather system that comes off the Cape area generally when we get our cold fronts they come from the Cape Town side which would be from the southwest but at the moment this is coming from the northeast so this is coming off the, the Madagascar channel and from Mozambique in that area but our females now stayed still I was hoping she was going to move but she's still down and still resting and Fumo is still down Tinio is still down Tinio popped his head up just now while we were off air and was looking ever so regal and then decided just to flop back down again and I think there's going to be very little movement from this pride for the rest of the morning so I probably th will move on fairly shortly try and go and have a look for other things and just see what else is around there's really kind of no updates that are on the radio so it might, might be just nice to bumble around in areas that we haven't driven for the last few days given that we've been so concentrated around twin dams and the Mulawati it would be nice just to go and check around and see what else is happening and see if there's anything interesting out on some of the other roads in Juma maybe Hyena Den would actually be a nice place to go and stop in so we'll probably go and head in that general direction to finish up our morning hopefully the hyena den will be active now there we go Megan so Megan I lost Megan again this earpiece is driving me crazy but we'll try and keep hold of it so that I can hear Megan for a little bit longer ah there we go so I, like I say we'll go and check out the hyena den leave our lions to their sleepy selves as they kind of enjoy this cooler morning and cooler weather that we're having and I believe Brent Leo Smith who is roaming the plains of East Africa has found one of the fastest antelope that traverses those said plains
Well, unfortunately, we had to abandon our search for those rhino. I'm pretty sure they're safely surrounded by that beautiful forest. So we moved a little bit further south now, and we're sitting sort of on the boundary of Ngama and Sausage Tree Pride territories. And there's quite a lot of game here, lots of zebra still, some topi, and uh, there's a lovely herd of buffalo that we see in this area quite often. And uh, my favorite herd of buffalo is they've got pink noses, a couple of them. So maybe we'll be lucky enough to find the pink-nosed herd of buffalo, as well as there was reports of a female cheetah up against the escarpment. Uh, so I'm going to keep slowly perusing this area. It is, I would say, probably one of my favorite drives in the Mara Triangle to come up on this very little used road on the edge of the escarpment and just see what's happening up here. Very, very beautiful and peaceful scenes this morning. And of course, it's a great area for birds because we've got lots of little laggers we've got to cross. So you never know what bird we might get. We might be able to add a few more bird species to your Mara bird lists. Okay, well, let's move along. Joanne, Joanne's wondering how impala, uh, zebra, and other antelope and, and ungulates out here maintain their hooves. Well, pure friction. So if you get a zebra or anything that's in a zoo or in an enclosed area and doesn't get to do much exercise, their hooves actually grow incredibly long and, and it actually looks like they've got injuries. However, it is not an injury, it's just a very long hoof. So when you've got lions and leopards and cheetahs chasing you, it does the maintenance for you. Keeps them nice and, and, and sharp and firm. Now, hooves are very, very interesting. Now, Jamie was telling me she saw, uh, for the first time a couple of days ago, on her way down, uh, two clipspringer. Now, I've only ever seen the clipspringer way to the east, but clipspringer hooves, since we're on the topic of hooves, are unbelievably different uh, compared to the rest of the, the hooved animals that, that we get out here. So most of the hooves are hard. Um, Clipspringer's hooves are like soft leather, like a soft pair of leather shoes. And that enables them to grip onto the rocks. And that's why they can jump on sheer cliff faces. Now, certain wild goat species um, also, uh, their hooves become like soft leather. And that enables them to feed on almost vertical, uh, vertical cliff faces. Hello, Zebs. Oof. Why are you running? I saw them looking up the lugger. Did they spot a lion? Now, a lugger is, uh, what well, in South Africa we'd call it a donga, uh, or a drainage line, but it's a, normally just a little area where water will flow down, a little stream, but that doesn't flow all the time. So it's, it's, it's uh, just when the rain flows and it'll hold water for quite a long time. So always a good spot to check for cats because of the shade that surrounds them. Because as you go further down, there's not much shade below. Oh, I don't, I don't know. You can just make out in the distance. You can hear a, a, a scallow's taraco calling. Quark, quark. Quark, quark. Beautiful birds with a not so pretty voices. Uh, we're going to keep checking very carefully along here and uh, see what else is about. And uh, hopefully Taylor's search is going just as well as ours on this absolutely exquisite Mara morning. Exquisite Mara morning it is. It's lovely out here. It's very pleasant. And no, uh, our plans are not going to, according to plan just yet, but that's okay. I mean, we've seen, we saw Pop passing Gama Pride this morning. And then we saw the two other lionesses, so it's not too bad. The cats are, of course, just not doing what we want them to do. Now, there was a question from Ali about if I'd ever gotten, well, have I gotten lost yet? No, not during the day. I feel as though it's impossible to get lost out here during the day because it is.
is so open so you can see everything around you've got the river on one side you've got the escarpment on the other and I know where north south east and west is I know which direction the camp is in uh, so it's not too bad and a lot of these roads they wind in between I'm driving on a road that I haven't driven before which is quite nice I thought well we might as well be checking this area let's have a little look around here and it's really quite beautiful being in this very very tall lovely golden grass it's just amazing how it changes. Juma and areas like Juma are obviously much easier to get lost in because you can't really see your complete, you can't see 360 degrees around you. Well, you can, but you're, you end up just staring into trees and bushes. So that can become tricky, but out here at night it is very easy, especially on a cloudy evening when you can't use the stars to navigate. This is a problem. And I just want to show you why as well. Why you would not want to come walking in an area like this. Look down over there. No, 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 stay in the grass. He just ruined it. The buffalo stood up, which was very rude of him, the one on the left. But he was basically sitting in the grass and all you could see was the tip of the horns. And I reckon if I was walking, I'm obviously taller in the car than I am if I was standing down on the ground. You wouldn't be able to see anything. Look at his friend on the right. He's missing the tips of his horns. He must be a very old boy. He's up, well, not both, sorry. He's just missing one. He obviously been in the battles. Look at that stance. He's not happy. But that also might be because of the fact that there's an airplane flying over and they've now seen us. So it just could... Of course, we know how wind muffles out sound. An airplane will do exactly the same thing. They'll find it very difficult to be able to hear us from this distance with that loud noise yeah they look like two very angry buffalo that i would not like to encounter on foot but it's beautiful though there's some cars driving past i wonder if they've seen anything but we're going to keep on this route though it's scenic wise it's lovely really really is fantastic oh there's some massive grasshoppers at the moment with, with all lovely um, colors on them. Right, so we'll keep bumbling about. It seems to be what we're doing this morning. Come on, little birdie, off you go. Okay, looks like a little quail of some sort running along in the grass over there. I don't actually know what that is. Um, I'm gonna send you back to Tristan while I try and find my way around this little bird without squashing it. Well, good luck, Taylor. Those little birds can be vicious. You never know. Maybe it's going to attack you. So be careful as you make your way around and also don't get stuck. I don't know where you are, but hopefully it's not in the area where there was lots of mud. I was watching a story that Taylor posted on Instagram of her slipping and sliding through a whole bunch of mud. And so hopefully she won't get stuck if there is mud in that area while she tries to negotiate her little bird. But we have left our lions alone to themselves to have a Sunday snooze. And we, like I say, are slowly meandering towards Hyena Den. But you can see in the distance what I was talking about with the cloudy weather that we've got at the moment. It's getting rather nasty out here. And I wonder if we are going to get rain. The clouds seem to be thickening by the minute. So maybe we will. Now, Megan informs me that it is 20 degrees or 68 degrees Fahrenheit and I can tell you with absolute certainty that it is most definitely feels much colder than that. I think the wind chill today is what is doing it because it's actually not too bad. When the wind gusts die down, then it's okay, but the wind is gusting so much and the wind is cold, 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 cold today. So it's just a shock to the system after so many days of nice warm weather to have a sudden change in temperature like we're having now. Yesterday was close to 90, I think it was about 96 degrees Fahrenheit yesterday. So to go from 96 degrees Fahrenheit to uh, probably with wind chill close to 60 or maybe even less 50 is, is quite a big jump. So it definitely feels that way this morning. And it feels quiet. I don't know why. It's birds, everything. It just sounds, all the sound is muffled because of the way the wind is blowing. You can't really hear too much. It's not like a normal morning where you're hearing the birds chirping and things happening. This morning it's really quite tough to actually hear over the wind and the rustling of leaves. So it's a bit of an eerie kind of way of starting the day and an eerie feeling, that's for sure. Hopefully our, our uh, hyena den will be active. 
and we'll have them all out and about. I would love to know where Gwen is and her cubs because we haven't seen the two of well the two little ones for quite some time so it'd be nice just to catch up with them and see how they're doing and whether everybody is still doing well but it sounds like Brent Leo Smith has well changed his direction and not gone towards rhinos but has found a spotted cat instead well, look at this. Our plan has succeeded. We have found this gorgeous female cheetah. I'm not sure who she is. I don't think it's the mom. Now, the elephants actually did us a favor because she was sleeping. And then the Ellie's actually caused, caused her to get up. But she is really, really hungry. So I think maybe the elephants have sparked a bit of a hunting spree. And I am loving spending time with Cheetah and the Mara. It has been definitely one of my highlights since I've been here. Oh, there we go, Ferg's too. And um, Ferg and I were just chatting now about where do we park? Do we have the backdrop of the escarpment? Do we have the backdrop of the... A great opportunity by looking at her as she looks out over the Mara. Okay, so guys, you're gonna hear my camera click once. Um, I need to get an ID shot so I can send it to Mara Cheetah Project so they can tell me which female this is. I think this could be Kake one of Kakenya's daughters. So with Cheetah, you use, unlike leopards and lions, you use the side. So now I've got a left side, so I need to get a right side, and then I'll email those off to Mara Cheetah Project, and hopefully they can tell me which female this is. Oh, she is beautiful. She is gorgeous, yes. Oh, isn't this exciting? Now, let me know how seeing this female cheetah makes you feel in just one word using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. How does seeing this gorgeous girl make you feel? I feel ecstatic. Fergus? Yeah, I'm Fergus, you're supposed to come up with your own word. You're not supposed to use my word. Yeah, exuberant. Exuberant. There we go. We're going with the X words. Oh, she's very hungry. Question. Jamie, how many cheetahs and lions are there in the Mara? Jamie? Now, Jamie's wondering how many cheetahs and lions are there in the Mara. Uh, Jamie, cheetah, I'm not 100% sure, um, but lions, uh, in the Mara Triangle alone, there's probably uh, close to 120 to 100, if you include uh, 100, but if you include cubs, probably up to about 150. Uh, in the greater Mara, uh, you're probably looking at a population of... Um, probably close on including the conservancies three or four hundred now you must realize that that is an open population that extends all the way into the serengeti okay let's just move forward at skosh you happy there ferg I unfortunately haven't seen any cheetah-sized prey on our meanderings because she's coming. She's heading towards where we were. Now the other thing what we do when we see cheetah is uh, I'll mark the point on the map um, and send that through with the photographs, um, and that gives the Mara Cheetah Project a very good idea about who it is, where they are, because you must remember these some of these cheetah, uh, female cheetah um, can travel a vast distances. Now oh, she's very, very aware. Now if she doesn't succeed this morning, she's probably going to rest up uh, during the heat of the day unless something wanders close to her but I definitely think my afternoon safari is uh, planned and it's going to be with this gorgeous girl and 
this is why I often like coming into these areas uh, where no one else comes because you do get some wonderful surprises. It sounds like we've got some one word tweets in, so let's hear them. Eduardo says spectacular. Eduardo says spectacular. Indeed, she is spectacular. <laughs> Fergus says, Eduardo, you took my line. Uh, D says, jealous. Well, D, we're happy to share this gorgeous girl with you. Now, she is off, unfortunately for us. There's one of those uh, <laughs> luggers up ahead. I just want to see if she crosses it. Otherwise, I've got to drive quite far back up the hill to get to the other side. Joanne Royal. Indeed, she is quite a regal cat. I was actually talking about it um, when I was with Amani's two daughters the other day. For me, a cheetah is just so elegant. Uh, even when they lie down, they just seem to make it look more comfortable and, 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 and they just look more elegant than a lion that sort of just bleh, flops down, urinates on itself. Um, leopards come a close second, but I think still definitely second to cheetah for elegance. Exactly. As Ferg says, the ability to lie down with their heads still sticking up. Oh, we got lucky. We got a, a natural bridge across the lugger. Um, sorry, I missed Carl's one word there. And she spotted something. I can see some zebra in the distance. Where are my binoculars gone? I'm just having a quick look what's up ahead in my binoculars. So far, a zebra and topi, which are generally a bit big for cheetah. Now, Suze is wondering which big cat travels the biggest distance. Now, in terms of when they leave their 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 natal uh, home range, so from leaving their mom, uh, I would say on average, cheetah probably travel the biggest distance. Obviously, the next one uh, and sometimes can extend uh, from there is uh, male lions, but the longest distance ever recorded of a, of a, a, a big cat dispersing is of leopards but it is less common so there's a there's records of a collared leopard dispersing from um, an area in northern Zululand and traveling all the way to the Kruger in a straight line that's about 600 kilometers but that is very unusual so normally it'll be cheetah and they can probably go 50 to 100 to 200 kilometers from their natal area just depending on the available habitat and home range around okay let's move forward again a little bit She doesn't want to go too far from the escarpment. Now, if she goes further down that way, she's heading into the clan lands, which is the north clan of hyenas, and there are plenty of them. Oh, oh wait, wait, get ready for another two shot. Hold on, Ferg. We're going for elephants and cheetah in the same shot again. And a walk into shot. Oh no, she's going to move. <laughs> She doesn't want to be in a two shot with the elephants. The elephants are the ones that disturbed her snooze. Now, up ahead, it, there's a, a pretty ideal cheetah spot for her to spend the day. There's one that sort of patch of shade uh, and a shepherd's tree and a nice termite mound. Now, cheetah don't like to lie in too thicker areas um, because 
a lion or a hyena might be able to sneak up on them. So they will generally lie in much more open areas. And we've spent all night with cheetah before, and they they tend to do that. Oh, there we go. There's the quintessential cheetah pose atop a termite mound, surveying for potential prey ahead. Gorgeous. Oh, stunning. And you guys must be getting some fantastic screenshots. Uh, remember to share them on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. Oh, she is very, very hungry. Heading towards the next termite mound. So we're going to stick with her and uh, see where she gets to next. I definitely want to stay with her till she goes flat. Uh, so we know where she goes flat for the, the sunset safari. Uh, while we do that, uh, let's go to Tristan, who's ha had no luck with a cheetah's worst nightmare. No, unfortunately not, Brent. The den was completely inactive, not even a footprint around to suggest that it was there were any of them out and about this morning and I think it's because of this weather if I was a little hyena cub I would certainly be inside a termite mound as well trying to stay out of this wind so that's probably a good place to be and a good area to try and go into because this weather is not ideal at all you can probably hear from our microphone just how much it's gusting what's that? Ah, so Senzo said a plastic bag just fell off the car. So let's go back and fetch that because we don't want any of that in the bush. There we go. Just give me two seconds to grab this offending bag that decided to depart our presence. It should be a two second little grab. So there we go. We don't want that lying around in the bush at all. Just tuck it in there somewhere, Senzo, please. So. That's the thing about our chairs, we try and keep it as clean as possible, so any rubbish we try and pick up as much and make sure it doesn't have any litter. Ah, Mita, you who is eight years old and you want to know about the spiders, the big yellow ones that we see in the summer months, and have we seen any yet and what are they called because you can't remember. Mita, they are called golden orb web spiders so golden orb web so if you remember that they're yellow just try and remember that gold part and then orb web is the name for them and meter no not yet so golden orb web spiders will only start coming out when the rains come that's when we start to see them for the first time and they start out very very small meter like that size and then as they grow the females get bigger and bigger until they get to those big big yellow ones that we see so none yet it's a little bit cold and a little bit dry for them still not enough insects out for them to catch and so that's why we haven't seen them yet so normally when we start to see those spiders is in around sort of january february in that area right now there are leopard tracks here I just want to work out how fresh they are. But what I'm looking at is, if you have a look here, is where a leopard lay down on the road. But they look fairly old, although the wind could have just disturbed them a little bit. But in this general section here is where a leopard was lying. And the track itself is in that front section close to that area there somewhere. So if you just go in closer so I can see. Um just trying to find the actual footprint for you that you can see it a little bit better maybe come down there we go there it is so that's where the footprint is of our leopard the toes in the front so if you come down just a little bit for me Senzo there we go so the toes are in the front and in the back pad that is there and this leopard was lying down in this area and I wonder 
if it's not from our mating pair from yesterday because I know they were left going in a westerly direction towards this area so I want to just follow this track a little bit further and see how fresh these are because it's difficult with the wind that's kind of disturbed them and made them a lot less clear cut than what I would have expected from leopards that walked here last night so I just want to check on the road here quickly because they do go southwards problem is it looks as though they've been driven over by a number of vehicles so I would imagine that these are not very fresh which maybe means that they are shadows tracks I wonder if shadows tracks were called in in this area I'm just trying to think if I've heard of her tracks being called this side now Megan sorry I maybe got one word of what you just said because this earpiece is playing up again okay so jam you want to know will the leopards leave if lions come into the territory um, not necessarily it, they obviously try and avoid the lions but they won't actually leave you'll still find leopard and lions they coexist to get in the same areas and um, they often are lions around and leopards I mean the other day we had the Nkuma pride and there was Fasana and Tamba and all kinds of other leopards that were seen that day so they just generally shift slightly away from where the lions are so if you have a situation where lions are let's say at Impala Plains any leopard that was there will probably then move and go somewhere else no these tracks are not fresh I can see their tracks here on the road they look like maybe from yesterday or maybe even the day before so it looks like shadow and her cub from a while ago these are not fresh tracks which is fine we'll carry on and not worry about them too much then and um, so the, the leopards will just kind of move a little bit away from the lions and then carry on Although, sorry Senzo breaking a bit hard there what is that in the road is that dung for a leopard looks like it Yes, it is leopard dung. I wonder how fresh that is, because that will be a clear indicator of whether or not these leopards are, well, tracks are quite fresh, because that dung, it looks dry and it looks fairly kind of black in coloration, which is generally not fresh, fresh dung. But whatever leopard it was, it had a meal just before it went to the toilet like this that was very bloody because its dung is black 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 in color which is typical of a lot of blood in the stool so I just want to quickly stand on it a little bit just to check how soft it is it's not very soft at all so I would imagine that it's actually quite old so yesterday would be my my bet now I don't know if any of you saw a little mongoose running across the road while I was talking about the leopard dung there was a little slender mongoose that jumped over so I'm gonna try and see if I can see its tail running through the grass they're quite difficult to spot once they get into the grass but it just ran right here close to this fallen over log Senzo look out for our slender mongoose running along No, I've lost it. I think it's gone in the long grass and it's just sitting still. It was somewhere in this general vicinity. Nope. That's the thing. Once they get into the long grass, the slender mongoose is so small and it's just the one of them. And they're not like the dwarf mongoose that are a lot more curious about what goes on and that will come and kind of check out the vehicle. They, once they run across, are pretty much gone. You very seldom get too long a sighting with them. Right, so those leopard tracks are not worth following at all. They are a little bit old. That dung's a bit old. It's not fresh, soft dung that we would want to see. And so we're going to carry on. And while we do that, I believe Brent is still with his hungry cheetah and hopefully it will get a meal. Well, unfortunately for this beautiful lady, there doesn't seem to be much to snack on out here at the moment. So she's moving from termite mound to termite mound, using the elevation uh, to try find some breakfast. And I'm very excited. I think 
I think I've seen her before. I need to go back and look at some of my pictures. I think it is one of Ken Kenya's daughters. I'm not sure if it's the one that spent some time down around Hippo Pools area. And she didn't stay too long down there because every time she did catch something, the hyenas stole it from her. Now, I'm not saying there's no hyenas up here, but there's less hyenas uh, than down closer to the river in the clan lands. Of course, the biggest threat to cheetah in the Mara is, uh, well, hyenas being one, uh, and that's more from a food loss point of view, but the biggest threat is lions. Lions are probably kill more cheetah. Uh, then you know, they don't probably they do kill more cheetah than any other of the wild animals out here, and that's why they have that special adapt adaptation to be able to lie with their head up. Why is that cheetah alone? Dusa is wondering why is this cheetah alone? Well, she's an adult female, if I remember correctly. She's about three, if, she, if it is one of Kikenya's daughters, she's about three, three and a half years old. So female cheetah are solitary um, and when they are adults and in, in breeding age. And uh, the only time you will see them together is when they're mating or when they have cubs. Now, we have been very spoiled with Amani's two daughters. Uh, they're still quite young, so they left mom and together uh, but as they get older they will that that bond they formed as cubs will split and they will head off on their own so as i'm saying i'm not sure if this is but if it is one of kenya's daughters um up until about a year ago they were seen together same as amani's two daughters and now they have gone their separate ways now she is scanning for any form of movement now that's how most of the big cats hunt she will look for movement and uh, from there she will assess whether it's something she can hunt something small enough with that's within her range um, or to something to be ignored now the one thing I've noticed with uh, the solitary female cheetahs in the Mara is their worst enemy are the topi and that's one of the whoopsie one of the reasons they are called the policemen of the Mara uh, is because they do have such good eyesight and they sit on top of termite mounds and if they see any predator they snort 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 so even if she isn't stalking something I've seen cheetah slink past Topi which is a bit too big for a single cheetah um, and just try and make sure that their presence in an area isn't given away now she does have some Topi in the distance behind her but fortunately I think they're a bit far uh, to spot her Philip, do cheetahs jog or do they just walk and sprint, Philip? Hi, Philip. Uh, Philip's wondering, do cheetahs jog or do they walk and sprint only? No, they do jog. And uh, uh, quite often they, they, they move a lot quicker than the other cats. Uh, and, and they can jog for some distance if they decide they need to go somewhere. And when they come down at termite mounds like the one she's sitting on, they'll often start off for the first 50 meters or so in a, in, in a, in a, in a quick jog. And have those topi spotted there? <coughs> topi, was that topi spotted something like a lion that's behind her? Um, so the sausage tree pride Jamie was with last night weren't too far from this area. And the topi are looking into the lugger behind, but I can't see anything from here at the moment. I do see uh, a battalier, and that's about it. Now we're being very spoiled this morning having her all to ourselves. And I say that's that's the joy of taking some of the, the less used roads in the Mara. Uh, there's animals everywhere and uh, it's quite nice to spend time in these areas. Aha, uh -huh. hi Dusa. And uh, following up with your next question, so why do male cheetah hang out together? Now, they don't always hang out together. You do get solitary male cheetah as well. But uh, the same reason male lions hang out together. The more of you there are, the bigger area the you can control and the more females you can mate with because you can defend a larger area if there are more of you. So a coalition of five males, it will be easily able to chase off a coalition of two males or a single male in terms of mating rights. So that is why the males will hang out together. It's 
so pretty. I'm hoping an Impala pops out on the horizon, or a Thompson's or Grant's gazelle. Dieter. Well, firstly, it's a it's a genetic mutation. It's a form of um, menalism, which is the increase in the, the dark colour in animals. So, a black leopard, for example, is a menalistic leopard. So, it's it's a, it's a genetic a recessive genetic mutation. Um, we do, you're not going to get any king cheetah uh, in Kenya, but the spots will all be fused together along the back. Not all the spots, but most of them. So, if you have a look uh, online and type in king cheetah unfortunately you don't have a picture of a king cheetah here and uh, that uh, will show you the, the the difference it's very very noticeable so there's only however been one recorded case of leucism in cheetah and that was in kenya but on the coastal plain uh towards uh shumba hills which is uh, quite far from here and that was of a completely spotless white teacher or a cheetah well not completely spotless the spots were almost invisible and that was a couple of years ago that that rare r very rare uh color morph of cheetah uh, was seen in kenya Ooh, i would love to see that but king cheetah that recessive uh, genetic trait seems to be only in southern africa and the last king cheetah seen in the wild was actually not too far from where juma is probably less than 15 kilometers from where juma is uh, other than that king cheetah have been recorded in zimbabwe and botswana so only south africa zimbabwe and botswana have uh, recorded cases of king cheetah and only one case of a leucistic cheetah that i've ever heard of and that was in kenya It is just so peaceful this morning. So beautiful. Quite a nice break from the cloudy, cold, windy weather we've been experiencing. So, loving the sunshine this morning. Just trying to hear what we can hear. It's a very soft breeze, and uh, can you hear some lapwings in the distance? This is a tree house. And a rufous naped lark as well in the distance. And I'm going to stick with our wonderful female cheetah, see where she heads off to next. While we do that, it sounds like Tristan is at his favourite spot again, Treehouse Dam. Well, I'm at Treehouse Dam because I picked up the tracks for what looks like this mating pair of leopards that were coming this way. So I just came to have a little look, but uh, no sign of them at the dam itself. So now I'm just trying to see where they went from there. I think they've probably gone southwards and out of our area but i just want to double check and make a hundred percent sure before we carry on um let's see there's a little pathway that they sometimes take that's not too far from where i am so i want to just quickly check there it looks like they came and drank last night and then i wonder if they spent a bit of time here before moving on later in the evening or early this morning there's no tracks that I can see this side, which maybe suggests they headed back towards Twin Dam's area. We know they came from that way, and remember that Kuchava's territory lies, or well, area that she's inhabiting at the moment, whether it's territory, I suppose, is debatable, because she's not heavily scent marking yet or anything like that, or vocalizing, but anyway, the place where she spends most of her time, let's call it that, is to our south and our west, so it wouldn't surprise me if that's where they've headed although is this their tracks here looks like their tracks maybe have crossed here just want to quickly see a little bit closer on this pathway So they haven't come across here, which is where I thought they would have crossed. There's a very major pathway that crosses over 
this road, the Shibamu Road, and heads down towards the fire break. So I thought this is maybe where they would have crossed over, but there's actually nothing that I can see here that indicates these two walked this direction. And I would find it strange if they turned further west. I would have thought that they would have gone maybe east again, like I say, back towards Twin Dams Road side. But we know from going to Twin Dams that there was nothing on that side, and I didn't find anything crossing Gary Main when I did it this morning. So, a bit of... Maybe they're still in this area. Hmm. Right. Well, I think I'm going to turn around and go back and just check along towards Weaver's Nest side. Nien, you're asking what happens if a dominant male leopard in an area is infertile? Well, I would imagine it's not going to be a very pleasant experience for those females because they're just going to mate constantly until a new male comes in. Um, I've never seen it though. I've never seen an infertile male leopard um, in my time. They've all managed to produce cubs. You'll probably find what the females will do is just travel outside of their territory to find the male next door, mate with the male that's infertile and then try and find another male that will actually produce a cub with her so you'll find that they'll go to multiple different males much like what we see with our, our females anyway they they tend to not just mate with one male only it's well, very seldom it's only one male a lot of the time you'll find it's two males that they go to or three or four depending on how dense the area is with male leopards but um, never heard of it never heard of an infertile male and, and where females have battled I've seen where times where females have mated excessively over a sort of six month period and battle 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 and then all of a sudden they've got cubs and um, so I suppose there's some males that maybe have slightly better uh, sperm count than others but I don't know. I'd, I'd imagine the female will just move until she finds somebody that will mate with her that does produce cubs. I don't think it'll be a situation where she would tolerate a lack of cubs for very long. This is where the only other place they could have come from, or gone to, should I say. Mr. P, you're asking when you think we could expect a litter of cubs for Kuchava? Well, if this mating is successful, so this particular session, then in 95 to 98 days we should start to see, well, we would see signs that she's given birth. The thing is, is that obviously we'll see her getting pregnant along the way and then we'll be able to have a bit more of an accurate sort of time frame as to what's going on. Um, if this doesn't work, then she's going to have to go and have well go have to mate again in a few weeks time and so the process goes on until she falls pregnant but hopefully in the next there we go there's a beautiful little steam i mean dyke actually oh no don't run away uh anyway it ran away i was hoping that it was going to stay but it's gone bounding off into the distance um so yeah her litter could be time soon it depends on whether or not this takes and whether or not they actually end up um, getting falling pregnant from this mating session that she's just done hopefully though it'd be nice to have another set of cubs around and I'm hoping that she has hers on chitra because that will obviously be for us highly beneficial because we'll be able to see the little ones which will be great um, and the other one that hopefully will be starting to mate soon will be Tandi. I know that obviously we want to see a lot of Tumba, but for the good of everybody, if she mates with with um, Tingana and falls pregnant, I'm almost 99% sure she's going to produce cubs here on Juma and ha have her den site this side. So it would be really great <coughs> for us if the cubs were born here because, well, we know what it was like with Shongila and Hosanna and how amazing that was. So it would be really nice if we had a similar situation for Tandi with, if she had new cubs and hopefully she'll be able to try and raise more than one. She's always had more than one. Every litter that I've known Tandi to have has been more than one individual, but she has yet to raise more than one. She keeps losing one cub in her litters. So hopefully she'll have two or even three, could we dare say it, and she then raises them to adulthood. That would be quite fun to see. Imagine a female on Juma with three cubs that we got to see all the time that would be a fantastic fantastic way to spend a good two years
Mac male leopards will most definitely um, kill cubs to be able to bring females into heat like lions do. We've, we've seen it quite regularly. Um, they they often do do it. So especially if they're a male that's just joined into an area, much like lions, and they come across females that they don't know, they will kill those cubs to bring her back into estrus so as to be able to mate with her and to be able to extend his bloodline. Now there were some drongos that looked like they were feeding on something on the ground here so I was wondering if maybe there was a little hatch of something but they've all flown off into the bush on the left hand side. There they come again. So you see it's busy on the around the road hawking insects so I don't know why there would be insects here. There's no sign of any fresh dung that would maybe attract an insect but there seems to be some hawking of the forktailed drongo. So there it is there blowing around by the wind and using its tail for balance you can see even its head feathers are being blown so I'd imagine if we came across a battalier eagle today it would be all ruffled up it, because they have much bigger feathers and bulkier feathers than what these drongos do and if the drongos are looking a bit fluffed up then the battaliers must be looking quite some like a sort of somebody who's had a perm I would imagine would be a good way to put it but off our drongo goes, unfortunately, into the thicket. You can see the birds there. It's quite funny watching the birds. Just now we came across a lilac breasted roller that was sitting next to the road and we were going to stop and do it and it took off and the wind and it jumped off the tree. The tree just kept swept completely in the opposite direction to where it was trying to fly. It was trying to kind of fly sort of in a westerly direction and it just got pushed massively from that direction the opposite way. It was really quite funny to actually see. So the birds are going to have a tough time of it today. They're not going to be able to fly easily. The birds of prey on the other hand will absolutely love it. Things like Wahlberg's eagles, vultures, all of those kind of things are going to be loving it because they're going to have not too much effort to fly and those birds that hunt on the wing will really be very good at being able to hunt all the other birds and those like like I say like Warburg's eagles will be coming down with speed when they're hunting these various little passerines that fly around oh there's Janet there's Janet Jackson no she's going oh no well we're gonna quickly lean to, across to Brent who's still with the cheetahs as we try and find a view of Janet Jackson they need to take a little rest and uh She's still surveying the potential animals around her, but unfortunately for her, I said there's not much. I don't think she's going to move too far from here. I'm going to stick with her for the rest of the morning and uh, see if I think she's going to move to one of the little gardenia trees close by, provide a bit of shade, but also quite out in the open, so she's not going to get surprised by uh, any lions or hyenas, although I think today is going to be quite a scorcher. I think it's going to be unlikely that the lions or hyenas are going to move too far from now. I'd say it's probably closing on 30 degrees early and probably one of the hottest days I've had in the Mara in a couple of months. And you can see, as it gets warmer, some of the biting insects and they start coming out. And you can see her ears are flicking a lot more than they were a little bit earlier. Uh, there's a whole host of little biting flies that live out here. And you can actually see them sitting on her ear. Even with the flicking, some of them are just not taking off. Little vampire flies. Now that she's sitting still, if you have a look carefully at her nose and, 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 and things like that, and just the shape of her head, for her size, her nose is, is very big. Now, of course, she's also got increased lung capacity and other special features uh, for being able to get to that really, really incredible top speed. So you can see her head shape is very different from a lion or a leopard it's a lot less elongated much more rounded and uh, you can see it's a much bigger nose um, for an animal of this size enabling her to draw in more oxygen to feed those massive lungs to get the speed going i 
There we go. Well, she dozes and waits. Well, not really dozes. Keeps an eye on what's going on. Keeps the flies off her ears. Uh, let's go all the way back to South Africa to Tristan, who's looking for something that is quite often mistaken as a little cat. Well, there is Janet Jackson's hole is just on my right hand side and we had a brief view or glimpse of her jumping up and then there's just been this incredible noise. It sounds like they're fighting inside here. Can you hear it? So there's squeaking. So I don't know if it's fighting or if she's got little babies inside here that are complaining. So I'm not 100% sure what's actually going on. I can't see anything. All I can do is just hear squeaks and squawks and all kinds of noise going on inside there. The other thing that I was thinking, if it's not young ones or if it's not another genet, that there has been a lilac breasted roller that's been trying to nest here. And the, there's the tail. See the tail on the top? There's the tail of the genet on the top there, wagging in the breeze. So there we go. What's going on inside there? There comes the lilac breasted roller as well. And it's now just flown away. So I wonder if this genet's going to come out and if there's more than one genet inside here and they're busy having a little fight or it's raiding the nest of the roller and is actually getting to the chicks. And there you can see the tails going in and out. Can you hear it? There, they're fighting. They're on top. It looks like there's more than one. I'm going to go back because actually I can see the tails on the top of the tree. The roller's back and forth. I wonder if it's not hunting the chicks. There's the tail again. So let's just stop here. Maybe we'll get a better view of it from here. But there's the, the tail just on top of the tree. What's going on? There's definitely some sort of commotion inside there and I mean it's not from us. There's the roller alarm calling and making a racket. There goes the genet back into the hole. Interesting. I wonder what's going on there. That's crazy. Now I'm super super sad while I sit here and wait for our genet to see there comes the tail again. To hear that Tumba just killed a massive male impala and just north of Tundams and the hyenas came and stole it from him and chased him all the way down into Little Gari. So he crossed out, apparently it happened in all about five minutes, but he brought down a massive male impala and then he got chased off his kill. So I'm super sad for him and that's not nice at all and the hyenas have been so, so sort of sparse lately that I, for one to turn up when he kills a massive impala really sucks. I was hoping he would get a f meal and get some time to feed off it. Yesterday we saw he was a little bit skinny but anyway at least we know that he is able and capable of bringing down even big impalas which is pretty cool to hear. I think that's the first time we've heard of him killing anything big so Aubrey said he came around the corner and he was busy throttling the impala and then the hyenas came in while the impala was pretty much alive and chased him off it and then he, they ran after him all the way past Twin Dams into Little Gari so that's a bit sad but there's the tail of the gen it's still flapping in the breeze so I'm not sure what's going on and what's happening inside there that there's so much squeaking and why a tail is sticking out but I would imagine it's got something to do with there's maybe some young ones in there or it's found the nest for these rollers when it tried to get away from me and is busy sorting them out But it's gone quiet now, so it doesn't seem to be as noisy. Love my, you're asking for genet is similar to a civet. Well, not really. I mean, genets are much longer, more elongated animals that have long tails. Civets are a little bit more stoutly built and are much bigger than what you see of a genet. A genet is a sort of low to the ground, small little legs, but very long, whereas civets tend to have quite long legs and they sort of rounded but coloration is very similar so they have the, a similar sort of black and, and silvery color to them and I'll try to find pictures of both of them to show you the differences just give me two seconds all right so there's our genet which you can see because we had only a little tail sticking out it's not the greatest picture of the genet but there we go it's got this 
sort of big ear section here, longish face and a long body with small legs and then this long tail that hangs all the way down. So even though we saw a tip of that tail, you can see how much longer the body is where the tail kind of finishes down here somewhere. The civets on the other hand, it's not great pictures in this book, but is a much more stout animal it's kind of got a more dog-like face or raccoon like and then it's got a big body and 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 this very short stumpy tail but they are essentially both nocturnal animals and the, and the coloration is similar but other than that they are quite different in the way that they look you also find genets are far more arboreal than what you see with a civet a civet will spend quite a bit of time on the ground but genets mostly up in the trees sort of scavenging around for food they do come down every now and then to grab food on the ground but most of the time they try and spend in the trees i want to just roll forward and just see maybe this genet has come back down to one of the holes that we can see it it was all curled up its head just put out the hole when we first arrived which was really cool but unfortunately it ran up it got a bit of a fright with us no, nothing there, nothing there, nothing there. Tail is not out anymore. Oh no. That's not ideal. Anyway, that was quite cool to hear though. I wonder what was going on there. Maybe we just need to keep coming and keep checking this area. Joe, you're asking if they're considered to be part of the felines. No, they're not. So it's a misconception that a genet is a cat. It's not a cat. It's in its own family altogether called Muscadet. So they don't have any part of the cats. They're not felines at all. So they're on their own separate grouping. And there's a common, like I say, misconception that people call them genet cats, but they're not actually cats. They're a completely own thing they're more related to things like weasels than they are anything else oh but i'm sad about tumba it's not nice at all hyenas that's very naughty of you i to steal his kill it's just making his way and to get a first kill like that it would be nice for him to have at least fed on a fed upon it and at least gotten some food out of it before it got stolen. I mean, it would have been one thing if it was stolen tonight, but for it to be stolen straight away, that just sucks. And that also means that he's been pushed off Juma by the hyenas, and who knows when he'll come back. Anyway, we'll try and look around and see if we can find hyenas on the carcass. And while we do that, let's go to Brent and his cheetah. Three, two, one, live, live. Well, our gorgeous girl's decided there's not much happening in this direction, so she might head back towards where we initially found her. And I think that's a good play. I think if she moves back towards the escarpment, back towards the Balanites belt, there's, there's likely to be some impala in that area, or even though it may be a cliff springer or two. And there are Oribi in this area as well, so that's also definitely something that would be within her her, her sphere of target prey. I think she's going to go find a shady spot to lie down. Uh, Bogdan is wondering how far away from the cheetah are we? Uh, Bogdan, it's currently probably about 30 meters or so. They do come very close to the car, but while she's hunting, I make sure I'm not driving directly behind her or right next to her. So if an animal happens to look towards my vehicle, um, she, it'll, it'll look and not see the cheetah. So we don't want to interfere. So I'm keeping parallel to her as, as she's moving west towards the escarpment. So there we go, you can see. So we do have incredible zoom on our cameras as well. And there's a, a, a point to that, and it's also to help us not uh, affect what's happening in the animal's day-to-day -day life. Now, now it's time to guess where I think she's gonna go sleep. I thought she might head for a gardenia, but I was wrong. And she might head for one of the Balanites trees. Now, initially, I thought she might head for the shepherd's tree she's heading to at the moment because there's a termite mound. There will be a little bit of shade as well, um, but it's in a nice open area. Hi, 
Mike, Sean, Sean is wondering, aren't Cheetah fast enough to escape a lion attack? Yes, Sean, if they see it coming, what generally happens is when a lion kills a cheetah, uh, it'll be a surprise. The cheetah might be sleeping, there might be strong wind, and they don't actually hear the lion come up, up on them, and uh, that's when they get surprised and they get killed. And a lion is so incredibly powerful that not even a big bite will be enough to kill a cheetah. So I think she's heading towards the lone shepherd's tree and termite mound combination. Some shade on the one side, some high ground, good spot. So I'm just going to try to get up ahead of her. So a lot of what we do is trying to predict where the animals are going to be before they get there. So we can be in the best possible situation um, to see them walk up and stop or even to see a hunt. So it is it is actually one of the, the very, well, I find it quite fun. Uh, and I think I might have got it wrong this time. <laughs> and that's half the fun. Where's is that other car still right behind us, folks? Can I reverse? Oh no, she's just stopping for a scratch and a flop down. So the flies have started to get to her. So you'll notice her, she'll roll onto her back and roll her head on the ground. And that's to try and get the flies off her ears. Come on, prove me right. Prove me right. Uh, she might be hungry enough to move through the day. I don't think so, though. As I said, today is, is a very hot day for the Mara. She's proving me... Right, we'll see shortly whether I'm right or wrong. And, oh, yes, keep turning left. Left to the tree. To the shade. No, not right. Okay, I'm wrong today. Uh, I thought she was going to definitely go for that spot. She's decided she knows better. Uh, there's a little termite mine coming up. She might just jump up it. No, I think, as I say, I think it's got too hot now, and she's looking for a place to rest up for the rest of the day. I'm still scanning ahead, making sure there's no potential prey around. And all I can see is zebra. Now, even if there was a young zebra, that would be a decent size for her to catch. The problem is mother zebras and stallions can be very aggressive. And a kick from a zebra would be highly detrimental to a cheetah. Even if it didn't kill the cheetah, that injury might enable them not to be able to hunt. Okay, we're going to have to keep up with that. TCP says beautiful views, beautiful views indeed. Uh, that is one thing we are incredibly blessed with here in the Mara, is this, these magnificent vistas. And then uh, they become even more magnificent when you put something as gorgeous as a cheetah in them. Oh, has she, no, she's just going for a jog. Thought she might have spotted some potential prey. Now, I have noticed female cheetah hunt quite a lot of scrub hares here in the Mara. And I noticed her walk from the short grass through a little bit of a thick patch. Uh, and that was possibly to check if there was a scrub hare in it. She's got lots of good options for... Uh, lots of good options for a spot to snooze. Of course, I'd love to see cheetah cubs in the Mara. <sighs> Me too. We actually have seen cheetah cubs uh, further to the south. Unfortunately, they're in an area where we don't have signal at the moment. But I'm sure that will change. But I, I think we will definitely see cheetah cubs in uh, the not-too-distant future with the amount of time we are spending with these exquisite cats in the Mara.
So she's heading directly towards where we found her. You never know what, maybe she had the perfect spot till the elephants moved her off and she's heading straight back for that spot. Uh, even a little thicket like that that's coming up ahead is a good spot for a cheetah to rest up for the day. At night, they tend to choose far more open areas. Question, Rebecca. Why is the cheetah's back arched and not straight, Rebecca? Now, Rebecca is wondering why is the cheetah's back arched and not straight. Well, Rebecca, um, they need to have an incredibly flexible spine. <laughs> and they have a much more flexible spine than the other animals. And that's to be able to reach those incredible speeds and maintain them. So, um, if you ever get a chance to watch a slow motion of a cheetah running, you can actually see how the spine sort of flexes. And that's the only way they're able to get to that speed. So, it's an evolutionary adaptation. Uh, that enables them uh, to, to, to get to that speed having that very flexible spine. Oh, she's going to be posing nicely now. Heather is wondering how often in the heat will the cheetahs drink? Well, it just depends on how active they are during the heat. So if they're very active during the heat, they're going to have to drink a lot. Um, if they're not so active, um, they're not going to drink. So she's already drunk a little bit earlier this morning and she drank out of a mud puddle. So she probably won't need to drink just yet. But if she happens upon some water, uh, she might not say no. She's still hoping for a last gasp breakfast. Oh, she is heading to an area where there's more likely to be impala around this balanite zone. I'm just having a quick squiz ahead in the binoculars. Unfortunately for her, all I see currently is zebra. Marie is wondering how long can cheetah go without a good meal? Anna Marie, quite some considerable time. Uh, they, they can probably go up to a week, 10 days without a decent meal. Now, in, in those circumstances, you'll find they might eat quite a few small meals, um, even a ground bird or, or, or a scrub hare uh, or a spring hare um, or or even sometimes insects if they're truly desperate enough. So they can generally get by on enough to sustain themselves between the next big meal. Now she is definitely due a big meal at the moment. Oh, have she seen something up there? Let me just have a quick look in the bios. Just zebra. Just zebra so far. Okay. I had to do some lugger maneuvering to keep up with her. So hold on. Looks like I think she's found her spot for the day. Well, we're just going to make sure of that uh, while we do that. Uh, let's go all the way back to Juma, uh, to Tristan, 
and something that's got a bigger nose than he does. Well, yes, I suppose you can call a beak a nose, although it's its mouth really, isn't it? And its nose combined. But our hornbills are busy feeding and they seem to be grabbing something off the dung that was in the road. So maybe a few termites that are in the dung and as they flipped it over, we have exposed some of those termites and are then having an absolute whale of a time grabbing them. Now, I'm glad I'm not a hornbill. It's not the best job to be pecking through dung to look for little termites and various other insects but it's amazing how effective that beak is you see how they flick the dung over and then underneath is where all the termites would be or any other insect that could potentially be there but whatever it is it's having a wonderful time grabbing them they must be minute because i can't see anything as it's throwing its beak into the air normally you can actually see when they throw things up you can find little insects in between the beak itself no I don't know maybe somebody's quick enough to sh get it on a screenshot as to what exactly it's eating I would imagine it must be termites or yes they are little ants maybe that are crawling around there or are they termites termites or ants one of the two it's very difficult to see exactly what they are from here you can just see the movement of the little insects on the ground as they're going along little small almost translucent insects so termites would be my best guess as to those hornbill is loving it though either way is really having a whale of a time and is enjoying breakfast and i'm sure brent's cheetah will be a bit jealous of our hornbills at its way that it's managing to fill its belly it's also quite a puffy fat hornbill as well so it's obviously done quite well in getting the food that it needs it's quite cool just to sit and watch them it's amazing how that big beak is so nimble Rebecca you're asking why they have such large beaks well there's a number of reasons for it first of all is to be able to dig into places that are hard to reach so they can get into kind of deep crevices and grab scorpions out of their burrows or between bark and grab insects from there so that's a useful part of having a longer bigger beak and then the other reason is that when they nest they often will seal the female in and so their beak needs to go through that seal and be able to kind of extend into the nest to be able to feed the female and the chicks as well as the female needs to get food from the male itself and they will use it to defend their chicks quite a bit so a heavy set beak is useful if there's a small snake around or something like that that they can defend themselves and get rid of it so but most of it is is feeding bear related they they like to feed in crevices and nooks and crannies and the longer the beak and the and the broader it is the, the easier it is for them to get into those places and grab any of those prey items it's also they need a fairly sort of deep powerful beak to be able to deal with things like scorpions and break off the pincers and the tails and all the other insects that they go after that are big and powerful so they do need a rather large beak for that what's that sender uh, so Senza is saying that this was the one that was chased away earlier by the other one. Well, at least it's got a chance to feed as well. And I'm sure once we leave, they will come back and feed again. So enjoy your termite breakfast, Hornbills. It looks delicious. Except the part where you are rooting through dung. Roshni is saying, other than the Wahlbergs, have we seen any other migratory birds arriving at Juma yet? Mm, I'm just trying to think. No, I haven't. I haven't seen any booted eagles. I haven't seen any European beaters. No cuckoos yet. Um, Red-breasted swallows. No, I haven't seen them. Talking about Wahlberg's eagle, one has just come flying over my head into the distance there. It's going to be difficult for Senzo to get anywhere near that, but there is a Wahlberg that is drifting just above the tree line. Um, so no, no other migratories that I can think of just yet. So it's still a while until maybe we get some more though i think this cold snap and this wind might prevent some of the migratories arriving but afterwards what will follow this maybe we'll see an influx of them and if we get some rain and a bit of insect activity then we should get them coming quite quickly so i'd imagine any day now though we'll start to see the the cuckoos and various others that are around 
It's amazing how quickly these birds fly in this wind. It's incredible to see. Now, I'm actually not 100% sure it is a Wahlberg's eagle. I actually need to get a little bit closer. So I was just having a look at that bird and I didn't really look at it closely as it came zooming over my head because I presumed it was a Wahlberg's but it might actually have been a yellow-billed kite just the way that that tail was deeply kind of wedged out it looked like a yellow-billed kite which is also a bird that starts arriving at this time of the year now Neen you're asking if they are territorial the Wahlberg's eagles well to a degree they are I mean they have a nest area and they will try and keep other birds away from their nesting site but we can see in relation to where they are there's another pair that is not even even I would say it's about 800 meters south of where this pair is here on Wahlberg's Road so it's it's not huge territories if they do have them and, and the only way the reason they will be a little bit territorial is to defend to do defend their nesting sites and make sure that they're keeping those nesting areas safe but it's disappeared now I'm trying to look for that bird and, and see if it was a yellow-billed kite or a Wahlberg's eagle it was really quite far away so I will try and see but I just where we are with is also why I called Wahlberg's eagle is because we're right near the nest in fact the nest is just in front here so maybe it was I don't know I, I'll have a look at the footage and have a double check to make sure but it's that time of the day I'm going to say goodbye head for breakfast but Brent is still with his cheetah and he's going to wrap things up well, welcome back she's still on the move and crisscrossing this little lugger oh look at that isn't that graceful Elegance personified a cheetah. Oh, I was hoping she's going to settle down soon. There is some shade around. We'll just find something smelly. What have you found there? Something smelly? Now you can see how her tail and ears are far more active now. And it's got warmer and a lot of the biting insects are becoming a little bit more active. There we go. A very distinct sort of little cheetah jog testing all the high ground as she moves. Plonk her bottom down for a while. And normally there are impala and stuff around here, so she's just unlucky this morning. Or she chased them all away before we arrived. Well, I'd say. Fergus and I have had a splendid morning and we haven't even had to go very far. And we bumbled down the hill, we found the Angama Pride and we've probably covered another two or three kilometers from there before we found this gorgeous cheetah. So it, it sometimes it works like that. Yesterday I probably did a round trip of about 60, so 65, 70 kilometers. Today I'll do a round trip of about six kilometers. So it, it all depends. Uh, every day is different and that's the wonderful thing about being on safari is that every single day is different we see something new we learn something new every single day and of course one of the most special things is being able to share it so everyone is hoping that she does get a meal me too but she's got to wait for us to get back so we can see this afternoon um, I'm pretty sure uh, she's not going to be too far unless she gets heavily disturbed by uh, a lion or a leopard or, or a hyena. I think leopard's the most likely if she keeps moving towards the escarpment. There's a little outcrop there, uh, quite a lot of thickets, but hopefully she doesn't. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to find her again this afternoon. And uh, hopefully she'll be on the kill. Or on the kill, on the hunt, sorry. That was horrible English for me. I do apologize, but I'm sure you're f f tired of looking at me, so let's look at this uh, lovely cheetah for the last few moments of the drive. Now, well, I think she's going to lie down soon. I hope she's going to lie down soon, and we'll be right in the same spot when we head out later on today.
absolutely gorgeous. 20 seconds, 20. I do love the elegance of a cheetah. So from all of us here at Safari Live, both in the Mara and at Juma, it's been absolutely spectacular. See you again in a few short hours.